X. As we're going through here, we saw uh, the uh, deacons named last week, uh, uh, and uh, one stood out, it, it seems, Stephen, uh, who said a couple of times in, in chapter 6 that he was full of faith and of the Holy Ghost, um, full of faith and power, uh, just this man who was filled with the Spirit of God and yet called just to wait on tables. And it certainly is a conviction for all of us, I think, that uh, sometimes we, we feel that we've been filled with, with the things of the Lord and, and yet all we're doing is waiting on tables. And yet uh, for Stephen it was such a great privilege and for these others uh, just to be deacons in the church, just to be those that were serving and ministering, uh, they knew that it was where God had called them to and what God had called them to. Uh, and so they were uh, wanting to be faithful in that and wanting to minister in that place. Uh, and at, at the end of chapter 6, uh, uh, for some reason, Stephen was picked out, whether uh, he was more vocal than the others, we don't know, uh, but he was picked out and brought before the Sanhedrin. Uh, they set up false witnesses against him, uh, sounds familiar, doesn't it? And uh, uh, then they uh, sat him down, and uh, as they looked on him, it says in verse 15 in chapter 6, as they looked steadfastly on him, they saw his face as it had been the face of an angel. Uh, just this glowing, uh, just this brightness, this beaming uh, of just what God had done in his life and his heart. And so in chapter 7, then, it says that the high priest looks at him and says, Are these things so? So he gives Stephen an opportunity to speak, uh, which he does. <laughs> this wasn't a one-word answer. Uh, this was a long history lesson that he, that he gives them. Uh, and you really can't break this up too much, so pray for us, because we're going to try and get through the whole thing tonight. Uh, so he said, Men and brethren... And fathers, hearken, the God of glory appeared unto our father Abraham. So he starts back at the beginning, uh, pretty much, and, and just ministers to them. Because remember, they've, they've always said that Abraham was our father. So he starts out with who they believe to be their father. Uh, the God of glory appeared unto our father Abraham when he was in Mesopotamia, before he dwelled in Haran, uh, and he said unto them, Get thee out of thy country and from thy kindred, and come into the land which I shall show thee. Uh, which is back in, in Genesis chapter 12, as he brings this history lesson to them and just speaks to them. And he's going to tie it all together so wonderfully, but he's going to get cut short. Uh, it says, Then he came out of the land of the Chaldeans and dwelled in Haran, and, and from thence when his father was dead, if you remember, he stayed there for a while for a season. It wasn't God's perfect plan. It was his per permissive will. Uh, he stayed there with his father. And once his father was dead, then the Lord called him again and, and told him to come and, and to move from that place. And so he does. He removed him into this land wherein you now dwell. And he gave him none inheritance in it, no, not so much as to set his foot on. Yet he promised that he would give it to him for a possession and to a seed after him, when as yet he had no child. Uh, so the promises came before he even had heirs uh, to inherit those promises. Uh, that's faith, just trusting in knowing what God has given, even when you don't see the results of it yet. The faith to trust God, the faith to look at God and just say, your word is true, what you're doing is right. Uh, I just trust you that, that you're going to bring all this to pass. The world would look at us and, and put us in white suits and put us away. <laughs> uh, but the Lord tells us to walk by faith and not by sight. Uh, and here's Abraham coming to a country. He doesn't even know what it looks like, has no idea. He's coming out of Ur of the Chaldees where they worship the moon goddess. So he's an idolater. He's a, a worshiper of the moon goddess. He's coming to a place of realizing that God is real and God is true. And he's spoken to him in, in the midst of a heathen land, a heathen nation, in a heathen service. <laughs> and he called him out of the midst because he knew Abraham had faith to believe and faith to trust. And he calls him to this great thing. And if anybody could, could complain, 
It sure could be him, couldn't it? He, he has no place to settle down, no house. It, it says that he always dwelt in tents, always on the move, always just being transformed by the things of the Lord, a, away from his family, uh, away from the things. The only one that came with him was Lot, <laughs> which didn't really do him a whole lot of good for a while. Uh, but he, he continued to trust God that God was going to deliver him and bring him to a place of walking in truth. And he does that with you and I, even in familiar places Sometimes we can feel alone and we can feel like we, we really have nothing. But if we've got the promises of God, if we've got the word of God, we can be full of faith in a power of the Holy Spirit and just walk in the truth of what he's given us, even if we can't see the final results yet. And we really all do that, don't we? We have this promise of heaven and we go, I know I'm going to heaven. We're, we're sure of it. The more mature in the Lord that we are, I think the more sure we are that we're we're going to be in that place with him. We, we see it written in scriptures. We trust it. And yet we haven't seen it. And yet we believe it. That's just God's work going on in your heart and in my heart for us to believe. And if we can believe that promise and if we can believe that God has saved us, then we can believe the promises that he gives us all along the way. And what a blessing that is that, that Abraham then becomes a great picture of just this, uh, the picture of all believers who come to faith, that we walk by faith. And it's that righteousness, that faith, that the belief, the trust that, that becomes then our righteousness. And so uh, Stephen bringing this out and, and ministering to the Sanhedrin that's there, because none of them probably have walked by faith in a long time. Because <laughs> if you think about it, it's all tradition. It's all just ritual that they're going through there is no faith in that it's just a a belief system w without faith involved and yet when the one who brings faith the one who is the, the culmination of, of all that that we worship comes before them they don't believe him and they kill him and so the lord sends somebody else to them sends a man called stephen not, not just the new testament church and peter and james and john and all the others are there and ministering but they send this, this deacon, this table waiter, and he stands before the Sanhedrin and he starts to minister to them and they realize the, the, the faith that he has. They, they see the, the inner beauty that's just grown out of this man uh, and they really come against him. And you wonder, why didn't they gather all of the church? Why didn't they gather the apostles and, and throw them in jail and put them before him? Uh, but they bring this deacon and the Lord prepares him and gives him everything that he needs to say in this time. He didn't have to prepare beforehand what he was going to say because the word tells us that, that we trust the Holy Spirit, that he's going to give us what we need to say when the time comes. And so here he is, he, he's bringing this out, and what a history lesson he brings. He, he really comes through Genesis, Exodus, comes all the way through to the present day and, and gives them the history lesson of, of the country. This man, well-versed in Scripture, well-taught and well-trained up by the Holy Spirit. And as he does this, it just really blows my mind that this man without a Bible in front of him, <laughs> without scrolls to unroll and start teaching from those things, it just comes from the abundance of his heart to give this Sanhedrin because he knows they're lost and the Lord wants to give them opportunity to come to salvation come before men who are the most powerful men in all of Israel and give them a history lesson that they should have known, but they should have known it by faith and not just by ritual. Because there's so much there that they don't know. And it's just because they don't know the Lord of the Word. Uh, and for you and I, it certainly is an exhortation to know the Word, but to know the Lord of the Word so that we can have the grasp of that Word uh, in our hearts and in, in our mouths as we speak. Not just the, the, the words, but the sense of the words, the promise of the words, the God of the word, to give everything out as he comes. And so in verse 6, he goes on and he says, And God spake on this wise that his seed should show, sojourn in a strange land, and that they should bring them into bondage and entreat them evil 400 years. <laughs> wow. <clears throat> and the nation to whom they shall be in bondage will I judge, 
said God, and after that shall they come forth and serve me in this place. The whole purpose of that was so that they could come forth and serve the Lord, not to serve themselves, but to serve the Lord. And so often we forget that, that we're, we're not here to serve as, as ushers, as deacons, as elders, as pastors. We're not here to, to serve in a position. We're here to serve the Lord in whatever position he's given us to do. It's always to serve him uh, because he's the only one that's worthy. And so he gave him the covenant of circumcision. And so Abraham begat Isaac and circumcised him the eighth day. And Isaac begat Jacob and Jacob begat the twelve patriarchs. And the patriarchs moved with envy and sold Joseph into Egypt. Uh, but God was with him. <laughs> it's amazing uh, that, that when uh, one of faith is sold into slavery like Joseph was from his brothers, that famine would come to pass afterwards. Joseph had faith. Joseph trusted. Joseph, a type of Christ, as you look through Genesis and go through, and we'll get there eventually <laughs> uh, one of these years. We'll get through towards the end of uh, Genesis. But, but just to see uh, the, the type that Joseph was of Jesus all the way through. Uh, but God was always with him. It, it tells us this in, in Psalm 34, uh, such a, a great verse, Psalm 34, verse 19. It says this, Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivereth him out of them all. The Lord delivers. It's the Lord that delivers us out of affliction. He's also the one that led him to affliction. But it was to get his heart in the place that was right so that he could then deliver him out of it, that he would know the Lord better coming out of the affliction than he was going into the affliction. And isn't that true with all of us? <laughs> Sometimes we go into afflictions, and when we come out the other side, we come out better because it's in the valley that we grow. We always want to be on the mountaintops. You know, when we go down to the castle in Pennsylvania, that's what we always talk about because the castle's up here on this on this mountaintop. Uh, and you know, uh, after the first night, you know, in two more days, we're going back down to the valley. <laughs> we're going back down. But while you're up on the mountaintop, it's just so sweet. It's just so wonderful. The word is precious. Everything flows and you just get so blessed. And then you have to go back down. <laughs> and it's just, oh. But, but the mountaintops are there just to refresh us and strengthen us so that when we get to the valley, we can still have the same peace and joy and love and assurance that we had on the mountaintop. And we grow in those valley times. And as we come out of those valleys uh, with that growth, uh, the, the world just sees a difference. The world just sees something fresh and new that they don't know about. Because they don't go through those things. They go through the afflictions. Everybody has trials and tribulations. But we have the God of those to bring us through. And to bring us through those things. Knowing that it's him that does it. It says that the Lord reigns upon the just and the unjust. He, he pours out everything upon everyone. But we're the ones that know it. Because we're the ones that are born again. That have trusted Jesus as Lord and Savior. And if we're those ones that are born again, then we should be leading the others as we go through those valleys, as we go through those mountaintops, to just represent Him in the midst of it so that the world can see what, what walking with the Lord looks like. And here's a deacon, a table waiter, ministering to the powerful Sanhedrin, the 70 most influential religious men of Israel, and giving them a Bible lesson. Isn't it amazing that the Lord would do that? <laughs> I think it's just his grace giving another opportunity to those that are there. Because remember, it said in earlier chapters that many of the priests have already come out from the priesthood to come to the New Testament church to become part of it. And so they've got to realize that something is going on here. And really, I think some of them are probably searching some of them probably just want their authority to be known that they're, they're the main ones and not the New Testament church, not Peter and John and all the others. It's them. And I'm sure there's some of that going on. But in the midst, God's touching hearts. And if Stephen was in that place of just being arrogant and haughty and just saying, 
Well, forget you guys. You think you know everything. I'm not even going to bother talking to you. <laughs> they would have never seen the grace of God. And sometimes we're put in positions where we talk to people that intimidate us in the world, but that need to hear about Jesus. And here's Stephen in that place, being able to minister like that to those that are there. But he couldn't have done it if he wasn't filled with the Holy Spirit, if he wasn't full of the power of the Holy Spirit, in trusting him that he was going to bring him through and deliver him in the midst of this. In verse 10, he says, And he delivered him out of all his afflictions. <laughs> and we go, Yahoo! In, in one verse, we see what took him 17 years to go through. Amazing, isn't it? We get one verse and we go, yeah, he probably didn't suffer much at all. But as you go through scripture, you realize he was in and out of jail. <laughs> he was taken. Uh, he was led as a slave, which is probably not the nicest of company. He didn't have a horse to ride on. <laughs> Just walking through, getting beaten as he was going. It says that the fetters in, in the Psalms, it talks about the fetters that were on his feet and his hands, that, that they hurt him. And, and we see one verse and we go, yeah, the Lord delivered him. But he saw the 17 years of pain and affliction that he had. And we think, boy, I don't know if I want to go through a 17-year affliction just to find out something that God was going to do at work in my life. Oh, can you imagine the day-to-day -day waiting for that 17th year to come? Oof, that's hard. But that's when you learn how to trust the God who's called you. And that's how we learn to walk in the truth that he's given us. He delivered him out of all his afflictions, gave him favor and wisdom in the sight of Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and made him governor over Egypt and all his house. And now there came a dearth over all the land of Egypt and, Herat, and Canaan, excuse me, and, and great affliction, and our fathers found no sustenance. Uh, the, the other patriarchs found no sustenance, and so they, they had to come to where there was food. You know the story in Genesis. But when Jacob heard that there was corn in Egypt, he sent out our fathers first. And at the second time, Joseph was made known to him, uh, was made known to his brethren, and Joseph's kindred were made known to Pharaoh. <laughs> it, it's interesting as you go through, sometimes these things just slip by us. But, but Jacob sends the brothers down, doesn't he? You remember the story. He sends them back the second time. And the second time, what does it say? That Joseph was made known. There's somebody else that's going to be made known the second time that he comes. It's Jesus. The second time he comes, what does it say? Israel's going to know that he was the one. They aren't going to know till the second time. Amazing. The type of Christ that's right here in front of us all the way through Scripture. The second time Joseph was made known to his brethren and Joseph's kindred was made known to Pharaoh. There's somebody else that goes through this too. His name is Moses. Because the first time he came and the Jews said, what are you going to, you're going to kill me too like you did the Egyptian? But the second time he came, he came as their deliverer, didn't he? The one who was going to deliver them out. There's a lot of these seconds that, that are coming through. And sometimes it takes us more than once to minister to people before they realize that Jesus is real and true. We can't give up and just say, I can't do this anymore. I don't want to do this anymore. I did it once. It didn't work. I'm done. Sometimes it's that second time that we come and show them the truth of who Jesus is, that they realize that he is who we're saying he is. Yeah. Then sent Joseph and called his father Jacob to him and all his kindred, three score and fifteen souls, these uh, 60, 65, uh, 75 souls. Uh, Jacob went down into Egypt and died. He and our fathers and were carried over into Shechem and laid in the sepulcher that Abraham bought for the sum of money uh, of the sons of Amor, the father of Shechem. But when the time of the promise drew nigh, which God had sworn to Abraham, the people grew and multiplied in Egypt. Uh, it's when God's promises are about to come true that the, the people of God grow. They're multiplied. They grow in numbers. They grow in, in trust of who God is. They, they grow in their relationship with him. Uh, and these things come to pass, and they just trust that he is there. And I think the church is all on the same page with this promise because he's promised to come back and get the church. And I've never heard the whole church as it is now 
thinking that the rapture is so close, that Jesus is at the door. And I hope he is. <laughs> I hope he opens that door soon. Uh, so when the time of the promise drew nigh, which God had sworn to Abraham, the people grew and multiplied in Egypt till another king arose, which knew not Joseph. Uh, uh, and you remember the story. Pharaoh was there. He knew Joseph and what he could do. He had him second in the kingdom. Another king arose, and it says in Scripture that he didn't know Jesus or didn't know Joseph. And so the Jews had lost favor, and then they became the slaves of Egypt. 430 years they were in Egypt before the Lord came and delivered them. Oh, but the Lord was faithful, wasn't he, to deliver them out of their affliction. It was a long affliction, but he delivered them. His promises are true. He knows how long we can go in the midst of our trials and tribulations. Uh, so it says in verse 19 then that the, the same dealt subtly with our kindred and evil and treated our fathers so that they cast out their young children to end to the end that they might not live. Remember, they were killing the babies, uh, uh, kind of like America is now. And the 65 million that we've killed with abortion, in, in which time Moses was born and was exceeding fair and nourished up in his father's house three months and when he was cast out, Pharaoh's daughter took him up and nourished him for her own son. We know the story. We will see the depths of it as we go into, into Genesis and Sundays. But it says that Moses was learned in all the wisdom of the Egyptians and was mighty in words and deeds. Uh, and when he was full, 40 years old, it came into his heart to visit his brethren, the children of Israel. <laughs> How did it come into his heart? The Lord put it there. <laughs> It's time, Moses. The time is here for you to move. I'm giving you th th this word. I'm giving you this this unction from my Holy Spirit to come and to come to the children. And seeing one of them suffer wrong, he defended him and avenged him that was oppressed and smote the Egyptian. For he supposed that his brethren would have understood how that God by his hand would deliver them. But they understood not. They didn't understand the first time. The second time they understood. <laughs> Amazing. And the next day he showed himself unto them as they strove and would have set them uh, at one again, saying, Sirs, you are brethren. Why do ye wrong one to another? But he that did his neighbor wrong thrust him away, saying, Who made thee a ruler and a judge over us? <laughs> Will you kill me as you did the Egyptian yesterday? Who made you to be a ruler and a judge over us? Who else would they say that about? Jesus. We don't want this man to rule over us. Mm. And we did that for a long time, didn't we? Till he grabbed a hold of our hearts and, and we found out that he truly was the Savior. <laughs> and, and he saved us. He said, will you kill me as you did the Egyptian yesterday? Then fled Moses at the saying, was a stranger in the land of Midian where he begat two sons. So the Lord sent him out and what did he do? He got a Gentile bride. Gee, there's somebody else that went out and got a Gentile bride. <laughs> There's a lot of types going on here, but as we look at these things, as we see these things, it just amazes us. But to God, it's nothing. He had this all planned out. This was all coming as he brought it forth. His perfect will was being accomplished. We look at it and go, Lord, you wasted 40 years. And he goes, no, I didn't waste 40 years. I got a bride. I got sons. And, and I got Moses ready to come back rightly. He wasn't arrogant any longer. He came back humble. He was wasn't proud of who he was. He was now humble enough to be able to lead two million people without going off on them and interceding for them, standing in the gap for them. And how long does it take us to get that heart from God for the people around us? Mm. So when the full 40 years were expired, there appeared to him in the wilderness of Mount Sinai an angel of the Lord in a flame of fire in the bush. <laughs> uh, and when Moses saw it, he wondered at the sight, and as he drew near to behold it, the voice of the Lord came unto him, saying, I am the God of thy fathers, the God of Abraham, and the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses trembled, <laughs> and he really didn't want to look and see. <laughs> I can't handle any more, Lord. And then said the Lord unto him, Put off your shoes from your feet, for the place where you stand is holy ground. I don't want you to be encumbered by the dust from the world, from the world's stuff, 
I want you to be free and unencumbered from those things. I want you to be free and natural with me, but come before me. Put off the stuff of the world and put on what I have for you. Have your feet shod with the gospel of peace. Come to that place, Moses, where I have for you so that I can bless you and, and encourage you and strengthen you. And he says the same to you and I, doesn't he? Put off that stuff of the world that's encumbering you and, and come to me. See me for who I am. Listen to my voice and then be set free to go and do what I've called you to do. Do you think Moses wanted to come back from Midian to a place where they were going to kill him? <laughs> Probably not his first choice. And yet with the God's urging, he had no trouble going back. And it's the same for you and I. As he speaks to our hearts and changes us, he puts us in those places where we would have no no other time have done anything like it. And yet the Lord then brings us to a place of saying, now is the time. And for Stephen, he's in front of the Sanhedrin and ministering to them the truth of the gospel, the sense of the gospel, not not just the wording of it and the history of it, but just the, the God behind it. Because God is trying to reach these 70 powerful men of the Sanhedrin and minister to them and draw them to a place of salvation. How gracious of the Lord, instead of just blowing these guys apart, to send someone who could speak to them. And for you and I, we certainly can't come to that place of being so ritualistic and religious that, that we can't listen to anybody else who's a new Christian come to us and tell us about something about the Lord. We need to be in that place where we can hear God speaking through the youngest of believers as well as the oldest of believers. Lord, give us ears to hear and hearts ready to listen and help us not to be so religious that we can't listen to people anymore. Oh. In verse 34, he says, I have seen, I have seen the affliction of my people, which is in Egypt, and I have heard their groaning and then come down to deliver them. And now come, I will send thee into Egypt. This Moses, whom they refuse, saying, who made thee a ruler and a judge? There we go again. <laughs> it seems like all of God's people have to go through there, right? <laughs> who made you so religious and, and high and holy? You holy roller, you. Uh, the same did God send thee to be a ruler and a deliverer by the hand of the angel which appeared to him in the bush. He brought them out, and after that he had showed wonders and signs in the land of Egypt and in the Red Sea and the wilderness forty years. This is that Moses which said unto the children of Israel, A prophet shall the Lord your God raise up unto you of your, your brethren, like unto me, him shall ye hear. And this is from Deuteronomy 18, and uh, a great promise about who Jesus is going to be. He is going to be prophet, priest, and king. Uh, he says, this is he, in verse 38, that was in the church in the wilderness. Notice that, calls it a church. <laughs> they were a church in the wilderness. They weren't just a people group, they were a church. They were a church body which spake to him in Mount Sinai with our fathers who received the lively oracles to give unto us, to whom our fathers would not obey, but thrust him from them, and in their hearts turned back again to Egypt. Their hearts were turned back. They didn't physically turn back and go because the Lord wouldn't let them, but in their hearts they were there. Remember they wanted to raise up and, and raise up somebody who would be a captain over them to take them back so they could get the leeks and the onions again. Amazing. They're free, and yet they want to go back into bondage. Ugh. Saying unto Aaron, Make us gods to go before us. But as for this Moses which brought us out of the land of Egypt, we wot not what has become of him. This is the, the time when he was up on the mountain for 40 days, 40 nights. And uh, so uh, the assistant pastor makes a golden calf, right? <laughs> and they made a calf in those days and offered sacrifice to the idol and rejoiced in the works of their own hands. Uh, kind of reminds you of Genesis chapter 4, doesn't it? When Cain and Abel come before the Lord. And Abel comes with the sacrifice of the sheep. And Cain comes with the work of his own hands. The fruit that he's grown and nourished up and brought up. And he brings that sacrifice that wasn't called for by the Lord. But it was what he had done rather than what God had done. It's the same thing that was going on there in the wilderness and still goes on to this day. I, I'm the master of my own ship. I, I, I determine my own destiny. <laughs> 
we are so foolish, aren't we? And sometimes we are so dumb, we can't get ourselves out of the way. <laughs> there was an article that we saw this morning. I don't even know why I read these things sometimes, but the, the scientists in, if determined in Norway that one of the biggest carbon uh, emitters uh, in the world are the moose in the forests of Norway. And they're causing all kinds of climate havoc. Have you heard such stupid stuff? <laughs> and yet people are there. Yeah, we got to get rid of them. We got to go blow those moose apart. Really? You go to France and you get diapers on cows. And there were, some of them are wearing masks because they don't want COVID to pass from cow to cow. It just We are getting dumber by the minute. And we're thinking that we're smart. The wisdom of man just foolishness to God and foolishness to know who God is. <laughs> Unbelievable. But we do this stuff. It's just like these guys making a golden calf and saying, this is the one that, that brought us out of Egypt. This is the God. Oh, my goodness. And we, we think ourselves to be smart. How much we need to realize how foolish we are. So it says in verse 42, Then God turned and gave them up to worship the host of heaven. As it is written in the book of the prophets, So ye house of Israel, have you offered to me slain beasts and sacrifices by the space of forty years in the wilderness? Yea, ye took up the tabernacle of Molech and the star of your god Rephim, uh, figures which ye made to worship them, and I will carry you away beyond Babylon. So because of their idol worship, he took them to Babylon. Our fathers had the tabernacle of witness in the wilderness as he had appointed, speaking unto Moses, that he should make it according to the fashion that he had seen, which also our fathers that came after brought in with Jesus into the possession of the Gentiles, whom God drave out before the face of our fathers unto the days of David." who found favor before God and desired to find a tabernacle for the God of Jacob. But Solomon built him a house. Howbeit the Most High dwelleth not in temples made with hands, as saith the prophet, Heaven is my throne. Heaven is the place where I am. Heaven is the place that, that I dwell in from Isaiah. In the earth is my footstool. What house will you build me? Do you think you can t contain me in a house, in a place? How, do you think that you can put lines around me and contain me? Do you think you can make things about me so that it would contain me and, and hold me in so that you can keep me in this little box and carry me around? What is the place of my rest? Hath not my hand made all these things? If he's made everything, how can we contain him in it then? The wisdom of man again getting in the way. <laughs> And so in verse 51, uh, uh, Stephen uh, really starts pouring it on and says, You stiff-necked and uncircumcised and hardened ears, you do always resist the Holy Ghost. We, we can resist the Holy Ghost. We can quench the Holy Spirit. We can grieve the Holy Spirit. It talks about these in, in scriptures, in Ephesians especially. Uh, but, but here it says that we can resist the Holy Ghost in Certainly, we want to be in that place where we don't grieve him, where we don't resist him, where we don't quench the work that he wants to do in our lives. And yet for these men that are here, these religious men of this institution are grieving the Holy Spirit. They won't allow the Holy Spirit to work. It has to be by rules and regulations. And sometimes our lives can be made like that. Well, I can only read during this time. I can only read when I go to church instead of letting God have the freedom in our lives that he wants to have. And he said, your fathers did it too, and so do you. Oh, you haven't learned. History repeating itself. I think we see that coming around somewhere. Uh, which some of the prophets have, have not, uh, which of the prophets have not your fathers persecuted? And they have slain them, which showed before the coming of the just one, of whom you have now the betrayers, and murderers who have received the law by the disposition of angels and have not kept it. And when they heard these things, they were cut to the heart. Not in a good way. They weren't convicted. They were just mad. <laughs> and they gnashed on him with their teeth. And, and there's really only two things that are going to happen with the word. Either you're going to receive the word or you're going to hate the word. 
You, you, you can't just be uncaring about the word. It has to either be your enemy or it has to be what leads you. And for us, we really need to submit ourselves to the word more and more so that the world can see a people that can be led by the word of God. Because it's a living word. It's a true word. But these men, even though they were religious, even though they had the Bibles in front of them and they read them every day and they, they went through their whole Bible every year, verse by verse, they didn't even know the words that were there. They didn't know what the words meant. They didn't have a sense of what the word was because the Holy Spirit wasn't allowed to work because they resisted him and they quenched it. It had to mean what they wanted it to mean rather than what it says. They were cut to the heart. They gnashed on him with their teeth. But he being full, there it is again. <laughs> so a couple of times in, in chapter 6 now in verse 7, or verse, chapter 7, uh, again, Stephen, still full of the Holy Ghost, looked up steadfastly into heaven. This is one of my favorite scriptures. <laughs> and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing on the right hand of God. And he said, Behold, I see the heavens open. Oh boy, they're already mad at him. <laughs> this is what I see. You know what it says to them? If he sees that, what do I see? Hmm. What they're seeing is a man that they're jealous of, a man that's being used by God, and they hate him, just as they did with Jesus. So upset with him because he was giving out truth, and he has a vision of heaven. Oh, remember Moses? He said, let me see your glory, Lord. He says, well, I'll hide you in the cleft of a rock, and I'll show you my hinder parts because you can't handle the glory that you will see. Here's Stephen looking up, being full of the Holy Spirit, and because he was full of the Holy Spirit, he saw the glory of the Lord, something Moses could only see the hinder parts of because he was going to be there soon. Mm. And he said, behold, I see the heavens opened. Wouldn't you love to have him write a book? Yeah. Tell, tell me what it looks like. <laughs> but we'll, <laughs> we wouldn't believe him. <laughs> we've got it in front of us, like Patrick said, we've got it in front of us and we still don't believe it. I see the heavens opened and the Son of Man standing on the right hand of God. And you really have to do something with that because in the midst of it, uh, it says that, that he saw the Son of Man. He saw Jesus, a title of Jesus, standing but what does it tell us in Scripture about Jesus? That he was seated on the right hand of the Father. So when does he stand? When he's receiving one to heaven. Oh, as he comes to greet us and say, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of the Lord. The others didn't even see any vision of heaven. They didn't understand any part of what he has seen and what was going on. They're already struggling with him having the face as the face of an angel. <laughs> They're already seeing the beauty that's coming through this man being full of the Holy Ghost and in power. And yet he doesn't condemn them. He doesn't call down angels from heaven to destroy them. He, he doesn't say, I'm done with you guys. I'm out of here. He does what the Lord has sent him to do all the way through to the end. We can't get ahead of ourselves and, and make those decisions that we're God instead of God being God. I see Jesus standing on the right hand of God. Then they cried out with a loud voice and stopped their ears. It's almost like your kids, you know, <laughs> when they didn't want to hear you anymore. Nah, 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 nah. Don't talk to me anymore. Just, ah. Uh, we, be, we become so, so baby-like when it comes to the things of the Lord and so rebellious in the midst of that that we don't want to hear what God has to say. They cried out so they wouldn't have to listen to him. They stopped their ears so that they wouldn't have to listen to him. What they're really doing is stopping what God is saying to them. Did you ever do that now? Well, this verse must be for somebody else. I can't wait to get a CD of, of this teaching so I can give it to my friend, <laughs> which means it had nothing to do for me, it's for them. <laughs> and boy, if we're doing that, then what's affecting us? Lord, is, is my heart in that place? And I'm not saying there's anything wrong with, with doing that and giving a CD to somebody or something and just giving them the teacher or giving them the word. <laughs> but to say it's for somebody else and not for me, oh, Lord, forgive us and help us. Because if he's speaking the word, then the word's for us. I don't know how many times 
you guys have gone through scriptures. And it doesn't matter whether it's one or zero or a hundred. The word always has something to say to us. We just need to have hearts to receive it. Because if we don't have the hearts to receive it, what are we doing? We're resisting what God wants to do. We're quenching his work in our hearts. And we, we just don't want what God wants for us. Keep your hearts open for the word of God and in the truth of who he is, that he has that for us. So they cried out with a loud voice, stopped their ears, ran upon him with one accord. Uh, there wasn't one in the midst that had heard with real ears. And they cast him out of the city and stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their, their clothes at a young man's feet, whose name was Saul. We're going to see him regretting this and talking about it in chapter 22. We'll, we'll read it when we get there. Uh, Saul was there. Saul, the one who's going to be changed. His name is going to be changed to Paul, the man who was an enemy of God, who came to love God with all his heart, soul, mind, and strength, and to defend the faith. One of the greatest apologists of all times. One of the greatest writers in the New Testament. Just amazing how many epistles he wrote. What the Lord could speak to him. And this was a man who was there when the first martyr was killed. Oh, it just shows what God can do with a life. Because we can't change anybody. But he can change a heart from being an enemy of God to being a lover of God. Just like he did with you and I. Because the scripture tells us that we were once enemies of God. We were against him with all that we were. We were enemy soldiers trying to kill him, trying to destroy what he was bringing. And he stopped us and he interrupted our lives and he brought real life to us and gave us that life that could then be a lover of God and not be ashamed of it. People aren't really ashamed of being an enemy of God, are they? They use his name in vain in all kinds of ways. And you and I were the same way. I don't know about you, but every time I hear it, his name put out like that, I just kind of cringe. It just, I, I can't believe they're saying it. I can't believe they're doing it like that. can't believe the heart behind it. But then I have to realize I was just like that. I can't point fingers at them and say, you scoundrel, you bad person. Because I'm saying it about myself. Because that was me without Christ. But now with Christ, he's changed us. You guys look different. <laughs> you look better <laughs> uh, so they stoned Stephen calling upon God look at this they stoned Stephen while they're calling upon God calling upon his name not calling upon him be, be in the right way with the right heart but calling upon him to justify them for what they're doing oh. and saying uh, Stephen in that place calling upon God too, but his was different. They were calling upon God be, because they wanted to justify what they were doing. He's calling upon God, and what is he saying? Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Sounds like somebody else we know <laughs> on the cross. And he kneeled down while they're, they're, they're throwing stones at him. He kneels down, that position of reverence, position of having God being in authority, kneeled down and cried with a loud voice, not just with a soft voice, not just with a voice that was uh, just spoken out of his heart with, with no, no vocal inflection, but crying out with a loud voice, Lord, let not this sin to their charge. Don't lay this sin on them. Lord, bring your forgiveness to them. Oh, amazing, isn't it? To have a heart like that. Because what's our first inclination to do? I'm going to fight back with everything I got. And if they kill me, they kill me that way. Stephen kneels down in humbleness before God and says, God, don't lay this into the charge. Just as Jesus cried out on the cross, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And we think they knew what they were doing. They were killing you. He said they don't know. They, they don't have that spiritual understanding to know what's going on in their lives. Oh, this man, Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit, it says so three different times in two chapters, full of the Holy Spirit, acting like Jesus, forgiving his enemies, forgiving those that were killing him. And I look at it and I get so convicted 
Because I can't even stand somebody cutting me off on the expressway. And these people are throwing stones to kill him, putting spears in the side as they were with Jesus. And Jesus and, and Stephen, others, Lord, don't lay this sin to the charge. And for me, it just means they've got such an intimate relationship with the Father in heaven that they can do this without any sin in their heart. just amazes me. I hope I don't have to find out because <laughs> I'm allergic to pain, but <laughs> I really don't like pain. But Lord, if that day comes, will I be willing to do that? And he says, sure. If you're full of the Holy Spirit, if you're completely given over to me in your heart and your mind and your soul and your strength, you can do this. With my grace, with my spirit working in you, this can be you. Just, oh, Lord, I got such a long way to go. He goes, I know. I intercede for you daily. <laughs> uh, he knelt down, cried with a loud voice, Lord, lay not this into their charge. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. When he said that, he fell asleep. It, it just uh, amazes me. It says this in, in Matthew chapter 10, uh, verse 28, and we'll finish here. You guys did good. Uh, he said, uh, And fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul. They can take the breath out of this body, but they can't take Jesus out of your heart. No matter how hard they try, no matter what they do, the Lord is always going to be there. He said, I'll never leave you or forsake you. They can kill you, but they can't take me out of you. Don't fear them that can kill the body, but rather fear him or reverence him like Bill had prayed before, which was great for this for this teaching. Uh, rather reverence him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. Reverence him. And I think in the church, especially in America, we've lost the reverence of God. We've lost that, that sense of who God really is. He's holy. He's just. He's true. He's real. He hates sin, and we joke about it so much. So convicting sometimes. Fear me, who can kill both body and soul in hell. Reverence me. Trust me. The people that you think you're friends in the world, one little thing can turn them from being your friends to your enemies. But God will never turn away from you. He's always going to be there for you. We can trust him. So, Father, we just... Thank you for your word. We thank you for the truth of it. We thank you so much for this picture of Stephen, Lord. Uh, would that we had a year to go through this chapter. Uh, just all the things that are there, all the history, all the, the things that he was pointing out and saying. And yet, Lord, you've uh, allowed us just to brush through tonight uh, these things. And just pray, Lord, that as we go through, these things would come to light. Uh, and come to pass in our hearts and our lives that we would remember these things, that they would be put into remembrance by your Spirit uh, so that we could just be equipped in the work that you have for us here, Lord. We thank you for all that you do, for who you are. We, we just ask, Lord, that you'd fill us afresh with your Spirit, that you'd minister to us, that you'd fall upon us in this place and just do a work in this place uh, of just helping us to realize who you are and who you are in our lives, who you are is a leader over this church body, that we would reverence you and love you and adore you. And Lord, that we'd be set before you to be those examples of who you are. So help us, Lord, to have that relationship with you where we could represent you well. We love you. We thank you. <laughs> thank you for this time. Uh, just thank you for... Uh, your word, Lord, that's so precious. We just thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.